Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. It's easy to stay sober 45 years. Just go to meetings and don't die. I mean, after all, I'm amazed at myself. I'm still floating around here. I'm 82, and I am mad because I don't feel good all the time. I was telling uh, George, and I we walked over here, that I think I'm being punished for my pride because I realize now I was always very prideful about my ability to have so much energy and I was always wearing everybody else out. And they'd say, oh, I'm tired. Let's go sit down. I'd say, what are you talking about, tired? Let's go on. Let's go, you know. And I was real arrogant about it, I do think. I do believe. And I think I'm being punished for it. <laughs> Your sins will catch up with you. So I've got to go on working on some of those those shortcomings. And uh, impatience is one of them. And being too critical is another. Oh, I like that one. Huh? I'll work on the impatience for now. (laughs) My name is Eve, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Eve. I'm real happy to be here. But just saying I'm an alcoholic doesn't say it all. You know, it doesn't when we're in AA. I can say I'm an alcoholic. I'm a happy, joyous, and free alcoholic. But maybe that doesn't really say it all either, because... I really should say, I am a happy, joyous, and free alcoholic person. But let's go back. Was I ever a happy, joyous, and free person? Not in your life. How could I be? You know, I was thinking about it uh, today, and I think those words need to be changed around. <laughs> I'm not rewriting the book, believe me. Uh, <laughs> But how can you be joyous and free and, and happy if you're not free? And I think that's the key, because I was never free. I was never free. And at first, when I first got sober, I had no recognition of how powerful and important that third step prayer, that part of it where it says, relieve me of the bondage of self. I had no idea when I first got sober how important that prayer was. Oh, it was all well and good to give myself over to God's will. I didn't know what the hell that was. And to do all these other things. But that no concept of that freedom from the bondage itself. Because there was no freedom as far as I was concerned. I never knew who I was. I would, had to be a people pleaser because I was sure nobody was going to like me. I had no freedom to feel free. To feel free to care. I, I always, I, oh, how many years has taken in AA and working on the fourth step and all the rest of the steps to come to some understanding of self. It took me a long time to do that. It's hard when you first get sober, at least it was for me, to come in here and think, oh my God, isn't this wonderful? I'm not going to have to drink anymore. i never forget one night I heard Bill say, no longer do we have to drink against our own will. And that opened it up for me because I never wanted to drink the way I drank. I never wanted to get drunk. I was always drinking against my own will. And so it was easy for me to say, isn't this wonderful, this AA, I'm not going to have to drink anymore. That was a lovely revelation. The not-so-pleasant one was to discover, as I went along trying to understand AA and the program and do some work with it, was the fact that I was the problem, not booze. It was me. And I think that's a difficult thing for some of us to come to grips with. It certainly was for me. Because, like so many of us, I had these mixed conceptions of who I was. I was... Uh, uh, terrible feelings of inferior, inferiority. We all know that. We all have that. But then mixed in with these would be these feelings of arrogance. These feelings of superiority. And this mixture was so difficult to understand. Because one minute I'd feel like nothing... And the next minute, I'd look around me and think, well, I'm superior to all these people. What kind of a thing is that? That's a sick ego. And that's why I wasn't free, because I had this sickness of the ego. And how can you be joyous and happy when you don't feel free? When you don't know who you are, and when you don't know how to live, and when you don't know how to deal with people, and when you don't understand one thing about love. Because how can you know anything about love when you don't love yourself? 
And of course, I didn't love myself. I thought I was miserable. I just thought, I didn't think I was anything. And I don't know why. <clears throat> I've heard horror stories <clears throat> in AA meetings of, of gals who had terrible backgrounds, abuse, and all the rest of it. <clears throat> and they have a good reason, perhaps, for being an alcoholic. And I never could find a good reason. I had a loving dad. He really and truly loved his daughters. He wanted to do the best thing for us. My mother died when I was 12, and of course, dad wasn't always too bright about what a girl's needs were. But he tried. He really tried. And I can't blame my alcoholism on the fact that he insisted I go to Bathurst College in cotton underwear when everybody else was wearing silk. <laughs> I have to keep stopping to drink the water because I have something called dry mouth. I had cancer five years ago in my neck and they treated it with radiation, which is great because it killed the cancer, but it also killed my saliva. I don't have any. And so I have to keep the... Uh, don't get upset sometime at a meeting if you happen to see me. Reach out my purse and have a little nip. <laughs> it's water. <laughs> I must say people sometimes look at me with a long look when they're in a department store or in the grocery store. Somebody's out. <laughs> And the funny thing is, I never carried a flask when I was drinking. <laughs> and so I was the oldest of three daughters. And as I said, my dad wanted to do everything right, and I'm sure he, he meant to, and he tried. Uh, but sometimes little things stick with you. It's funny how, how we, we latch on to some idea that we get, which is taken in a completely wrong context, and that's our interpretation of things. How often we will... We will misinterpret actions and words that other people say so that we turn it in on ourselves. And um, after my mother died, we used to visit uh, family and friends on Sunday afternoons. Back in the 19th century, they used to go calling on Sunday afternoon. Now you watch football. But um, <laughs> we would go, and Daddy would talk about us, and he would introduce my youngest sister, and he would say, this is Daddy's peach. He always called her Peach because she had a peaches and cream complexion. She was only five or six, and she was really darling. And then he'd get to my next sister, and he'd say, This is a sis, and she's the beauty of the family. And everybody would look at her and ooh and ah and talk about how pretty she was. And then he'd come to me, and there'd be a long pause. <laughs> and then he would say, And this is Daddy's big girl. How I hated that, because I was big. I, I was as tall as I am now. I was taller than I am now. I've shrunk a little. <laughs> when I was 13 or 14 years old, I was five, eight and a half, which back in the 19th century was very tall for women. They didn't have brook shields around at that time. <laughs> and all the men were pygmies. You know? <laughs> and so I always felt like a giantess. And so here's this... this uh, this tag I had of Daddy's big girl. And of course, I knew how homely I was. I had this enormous nose. And people would be kind and say, but darling, it's a Roman nose. And the kids would say, sure, Roman, all over your face. <laughs> <laughs> and I was all, all knees and nose and elbows and long arms, simian, you know, simian arms. That means monkey-like. <laughs> and... Oh, I guess you're an older group. You did get an education. Uh, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> so anyhow, I went through my high school years, very uncomfortable, very miserable, didn't know how to really get along. I didn't have very many friends. I had one girlfriend, she and I, who would buy Red Seal records and listen to the opera in the afternoon. That was the extent of our excitement. I loved it, and I've been an opera buff ever since. But uh, she was almost as homely as I was and didn't know how to get along either, so we just gravitated to each other, and that was very nice. It was comforting that I had that, that one little friend. But I, I wasn't popular, uh, and uh, in the school plays, because I was tall, I always got a part as a boy, and, and that, that ensured my being around for a little bit. But I was always looking for some way to identify myself. I didn't know who I was. I had to kind of latch on to somebody else's identity, I think, in order to, to create some sort of an impression 
uh, that people would know who I was. I wanted to be somebody. Don't we all want to be somebody? And I think one of the great lessons in AA is that we can learn that we are somebody even if we're nobody. Damn it, we are somebody. Each one of us is divine, unique. There's no one else like us anywhere in the world. Sometimes it's a good thing. But, you know, <laughs> we, it, it's, it's wonderful. But I can remember so well, because I didn't have, we didn't belong to any social clubs. My dad was a writer, and so his income was up and down. And so uh, I didn't have the, the opportunity to belong to a lot of the social clubs the girls that went to the private school with me went to. But I used to, every year, my uncle was a famous actor, uh, a star, and he had his own company. And occasionally dad would have a play on Broadway, whatever it was, or some friend he knew that we would go ahead and he'd say, now you can have your birthday party, dear, or a party, whatever it was, and pick out your friends, and we'd hire a couple of limousines, and we'd drive off to the theater, and we'd have boxes, and we'd go backstage, and we'd meet the actors and all the rest of it. And for about two weeks, I was on a high, because everybody was saying, there is he, you know, I was on his show, and so we went to the theater, I met him, I met him. You know, he kissed me, you know, all this stuff, and I was shining and reflecting glory. That was the only way I knew how to be anybody, was to shine in reflected glory. And I carried that on for years and years and years. I was always somebody else's niece, somebody else's daughter, somebody else's wife, somebody else's mother. I was never a person. And so I was always searching for an identity, and I never found it until I got into AA. And I'd like to say that I got it quickly in AA, but I didn't. I was real slow in AA. I was real slow receiving what, you, receiving what you were trying to give me. I think that that's one of the biggest lessons we have to learn, is how to receive. It seems very difficult for us to receive when things are offered to us freely. And I've come to the conclusion that for some reason we have the idea that to receive something freely given like that is in some way going to diminish us in the eyes of the giver. Think about it. Think how many times you go out to lunch with somebody and they say, I'll take the check. And you say, oh, no, you don't. Oh, no, you're, I'll take the check. You may not have enough money to buy hamburger for the kid's dinner, but you'll take the check because somehow if you don't, that other person's going to think less of you. And so I think that we have to look at that and how important it is that it's important for us to receive because if we don't, we're denying another person great pleasure and great joy. We know how much we give, love to give to, and to have somebody receive graciously so we have to learn to do the same thing. But I didn't know how to do any of those things. I didn't know how to communicate. I didn't know how to get along with people. And uh, and, and I was terribly star crazy, or famous crazy. I don't know what you'd call it. Crazy. But anyway, <laughs> I remember I remember once my, my family being in and of the theater, of course, I had opportunities to meet a lot of very famous people. But I was always terribly nervous and terribly uncomfortable, never able to say anything. I was always wanting to impress them. And of course, with that attitude, I never did. But uh, I can remember uh, uh, such a long time ago, you probably never even heard of him, but there was a wonderful author named Booth Tarkington, and I had read all of his books from Alice Adams on up. And he came up to the theater where we were playing that summer, and uh, my father introduced me to him, and I thought I was going to faint. I thought I was going to faint. Because he was brilliant, he was wonderful, he was marvelous, and I was nobody. I was nothing. And I carried that feeling around with me for the longest time. I found it very, very hard uh, to know who I was and to have any sense of self-worth. College didn't help very much. I went off to college too young. I was only 16. I was, you know, like we all of us are. I was bright, sharp. Didn't know anything, but I was bright, you know. <laughs> And so I got off to college at the early age of 16, and it was a disaster. My first roommate requested a transfer. She couldn't stand me. And I went into a complete and total rejection. Uh, I wanted to go home. I, I couldn't bear it. And just five minutes later, I'm in all this rejection about this gal wanting a transfer, and my new roommate walks in, and she's one of those, uh, what we used to call a grind, you know, greasy hair, books, and eyeglasses. I didn't wear glasses then. Anybody wore glasses, you know. What was old Dorothy Parker saying? Men seldom wear glasses, the girls who wear glasses. That's changed. Glasses are in. Anyway. <laughs> and after all this feeling of absolute rejection and fear and uh, all the rest of it, I look at this girl and I say, but I deserve better than this. 
I mean, there's that damn thing again of superiority one minute after inferiority the next, before it. I never could understand how that went on. I didn't drink. This is all during Prohibition years. I went to Vassar in 1924 at age 16. Figured out I'm 82. So uh, uh, it was that era of Prohibition, that wonderful experiment where nobody was ever going to drink again. Uh, and, of course, I think the legacy of Prohibition, actually, the, the very sad legacy of Prohibition, was that it made public intoxication socially acceptable, which it never had been before. It got to be the end thing. It was smart to say, you would, oh, what happened last night? I did? I had a good time? Oh, goody. You know, uh, how sad that you have to ask somebody if you had a good time. I wish I had a dime for every time I've done it. But it is, it is sad. The lost moments. Uh, well, maybe some of them we just as well lost. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Anyhow, I didn't drink, but I knew I was going to go to Europe at the end of my sophomore year. I figured if I, if I waited and, and, and drank in Europe as Europeans did graciously, uh, just a little wine with my meals, that, that would be charming. And uh, I didn't wait till I got to Europe. They began to serve 12 miles out. And a person next to me ordered an orange blossom, so I didn't know what to order, so I had an orange blossom. Not one of my favorite drinks, but then at that time it served its purpose. And once I had that orange blossom, the magic happened. It was There it was, the very first time I had a drink. There was the magic. All of a sudden, down the hatch, and I'm eye, five foot two, eyes of blue, and adorable. <laughs> I knew I had found the answer. I knew I had found that elixir, that something that was going to make it possible for me to cope with living. It made me feel okay about me for the first time. Needless to say, I didn't stop at one. I never had any control, really, of how much I drank. Oh, there were times when I'd be ladylike and I would only drink a little bit and so forth later on. Uh, but I, I got drunk on that trip to Europe. I was only 17 years old, and I got drunk a couple of times. I remember being terribly embarrassed. I had a terribly smart date in Paris, and Joe Zelly's used to be the smart restaurant that you went to, and they served us warm champagne, and I'm with this darling guy. I was always looking at darling guys and not knowing what the hell to do with them. <laughs> but, and I, I threw up. I threw up all over the goddamn thing. <laughs> it's not the best way to impress somebody. Not, not the right way. And I came back for, to college, and of course, by then, then I realized that I could drink at every social occasion, and some of the social occasions were on campus, and so I got kicked out. And, uh, and I left college. And uh, I was going to be an actress. I was going to be in the theater. I was going to be a star. Of course I was going to be a star. Who wants to be a little actress? No point in being a little actress. Be a star, sure. And of course, that's what we all do. We, we, we're trying to prove. I, I think that I didn't put that together until I got sober. I wanted to be an actress, ha ha, a star, because I wanted people to approve of me. And I think I felt that if I had people coming up to me and saying, oh, you were marvelous, you were wonderful, and so forth, I'd know I was somebody, you know? And I think we all do that. I've never 12-stepped anybody who said their goal was to be the second best teacher, the second best stenographer, the second best truck driver. We all of us want to prove something, prove that we're somebody. Because I think it's that inner emptiness inside. It's that terrible hollowness in here that the booze seems to have filled up, that the booze seems to have made us feel okay. And we are hoping that if we are somebody, that will fill up. But it, it didn't fill up. It didn't fill up. I didn't get to be anybody as far as the theater was concerned. My uncle was very gracious when he finally, after seven, seven or eight years of touring all over the country with him, he finally came to me and said, my dear, I'm afraid... Next year, we don't have any parts big enough for you. And that let me out, and so forth. But things were not going well. Things were not going well. I started getting married. It's one of the things we do. And uh, I had a, a beautiful little boy as a result of that marriage. Of course, the marriage didn't last. I didn't understand what love was. I didn't really and truly really know. I thought that if somebody made a pass at me, it proved I was attractive. I mean, I, I could look back in absolute horror, but I could see myself sitting on a bar stool, you know, drunk and so forth, and the guy's making a pass at me, I think, isn't that wonderful? That means I'm attractive. <laughs> you know, I, I mistook the, the sexual overture as, as a proof that I was attractive. And nothing is less attractive than a drunken woman, I don't believe. And I can remember way back when, when I started to smoke, how upset my dear grandmother was, my 
my, my Methodist grandmother up in Connecticut. She saw me smoking and she used to rub, rub her fingers over the mission rocker. Mission was a kind of furniture back in those days. And she'd run her fingers over this rocker and she'd say, my dear, smoking leads to drinking and drinking leads to prostitution. <laughs> I never got paid. <laughs> I finally found the man of my dreams. He drank the same way I drank. And that made him totally acceptable as far as I was concerned. And we got married. And we had everything going for us. Everything. He loved me and I loved him. He'd been in the radio business. I'd been in sort of a half-assed. Excuse me. <laughs> Actress. <laughs> and we thought marriage was going to be great, and of course we were both alcoholics, neither one of us knew it, neither one of us had any knowledge about alcoholism. Our drinking was out of control as far as we were both concerned. He was working for his family at $25 a week. I didn't realize he was unemployable in the radio business. He had lost all of his contacts there because of his alcoholism. And I, of course, was out of the theater. And so we got married. And uh, it, it, we thought it was going to be wonderful. We had two beautiful little girls. My little boy from my first marriage came to live with us. And it was going to be wonderful. But the trouble was we were both alcoholics, and it was horrible. I mean, there were moments that were wonderful, of course. But there were also those awful moments with two people trying to live together, both of them alcoholics, neither one of them having un any understanding of what the disease was all about. We didn't talk about alcoholism back then. That word wasn't really popular until a word, book came out, Alcoholics Anonymous, and the word alcoholic suddenly took off. There were other words back then. I can remember my mother-in-law leaving a little note on her refrigerator. She'd come to visit us, and we were both of us in bad shape, and she only stayed very briefly, and she left, she left this little note on the refrigerator. And it said, my dear children, the world frowns upon inebriates. Inebriates? Inebriates. Any of you who don't like the word alcoholic, try dips, uh, uh, inebriate, you know. There's another good one, dipsomania. My mother-in-law was always pointing to the house down the hill out in Madison, New Jersey, where my in-laws lived. She'd say, you know, the woman who lives in that house is a dipsomaniac. And then she'd look at me. I got the message. But I wasn't ready at that time. And so the awful things happened to two little girls. I, I used to feel so guilty. I began to hate myself. I felt so unworthy. My poor son he, he oftentimes had to stay home from the school to look after the kids because I was in such bad shape that I was afraid. I was always trying to stop. I put myself through hell morning after morning after morning because I did not want to drink. I did not want to get drunk. I wanted to stop. And I would be in such terrible shape. I'd be trembling and shaking. And I would not take a drink because I wanted not to drink. And the result was that I would be in no shape to take care of the kids or anything else. And so my dear son, uh, he was nine years older than his little sister and 11 or 12 years older than the next little girl. And so I used to make him stay home from school to look after those kids because I was, I was trying so hard not to drink. And I, I hated Roger. I hated Roger, my husband, because he would pour half a tumbler of whiskey and be all healed up and go off to work. Of course, he'd be home drunk that night, but... You know, he, he would get well, and I was always trying not to drink. And it drove me crazy to feel so terrible and, and to go on drinking when I didn't want to. I really didn't want to drink. And I put myself through a hell of a lot of, of bad days because of it. And I can remember getting on the, pouring a drink in my hand, shaking, and getting on the telephone and calling somebody up and saying, Hi, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. And then I quickly take a drink because I thought, well, if I go mad or berserk or crazy or something, they'll know it on the other end of the phone and help will come. Because I, I didn't know what caused DTs. I didn't, I didn't realize that it was withdrawal, that it was going without. I was afraid that if I took the drink, I might do something terrible. And, uh, but you see, with both of us alcoholics, neither one of us looked at ourselves. I kept looking at him. You know, that bastard. You know, he's the reason I drink. People would come to me and say, you know, either you're drinking more than you used to. And I said, I know. It's just some of it. I couldn't stand living with it. I, you know. And I believed it. 
And his family kept writing him letters about it was too bad that he married that woman who drank so badly because they were sure that was the reason he drank so much. And, you know, we always do that. Other people's situations, things, those are the things we blame. We never look within. But I began to hate myself. I began to uh, feel desperate about what I was doing. I, I adored my children. I, I think that learning finally to love my children was the first time I ever had a sense of real love, total commitment without thought of return. And I adored them. And I hated myself for what I was doing to them. It's a miracle they were both lived through it because I did terrible things. And sometimes sins of omission as much as sins of commission. And so often they'd want to go out to the park and play and I'd be too sick to take them and I'd hate myself. And uh, finally that my mother-in-law came and she left that little note that I mentioned about the world frowns upon an idiot. But she added to that, but she said, I've written to the Alcoholic Foundation, which is the old name for the General Service Office, and asked them to send you some literature about AA. And the literature came, and when I read it for the first time in my life, I felt hope. There was a story, in one of the pamphlets, there was a story about a woman, and I realized that there was one woman somewhere in this world who felt the way I felt, who did the things I did, who hated herself as much as I hated myself, and that she had been able to find a way not to drink. And it was the first time I'd ever had any hope. It was the first time I was able to recognize the fact that I had a problem, that it wasn't Roger. It wasn't all the bad circumstances. It wasn't the poverty. We were always broke. How could we not be always broke with two people, both of them drinking, and trying to pretend like everything's okay? You know, that's half the awful part of it. If you could just be honest with everybody, if you could just say, oh, hell, I feel terrible that I got so drunk last night. It's awful. Instead of saying, oh, I'm fine. How are you today? It's a beautiful day, isn't it? <laughs> and you're dying inside. If you could just say, oh, God, I've got such a hangover. I'm ready to die. And we cover up and we lie and because we know down deep inside that we shouldn't be that way. I think that's probably why. There's a terrible feeling of shame and guilt involved in our illness. And thank God over the years we're beginning to learn that shame and guilt have no part in recovery. Because we can't recover as long as we feel shame and guilt. We have to learn to forgive ourselves, and the basis for that is to learn to love ourselves, and that's not the easiest thing to do. When we look at the pattern of life as we've lived it over the years, drinking, and we come to this program and start trying to live a different life, we're sober. So I finally did reach that point. I knew that I was an alcoholic, and I told my son that I knew I was an alcoholic, and I told him that if I... That I Roger wouldn't go to AA with me. I asked him if he would go, and he said, no, he wouldn't go. So what do you want to do that God stuff? I read the Jack Alexander piece also, and he didn't like that. So anyhow, it was, it, he wasn't going to go, and so I couldn't go. So I told my little boy, I said, I'm sorry, honey. I can't go to AA by myself, but I promise you I'll never drink again. And that was a brave promise. I meant it. But I said, I also promise that if I can't do it alone, I will go to AA. And of course, that summer I took the children up to the country. We had a funny old farmhouse shack, very primitive, no running water, outside privy. It was all that we could afford to buy at that point. And, uh, but it was out of the city for the kids, and that was the important thing. And I got drunk and stayed drunk most of the summer. And when I got back to New York, I finally got a hold of AA. And thank God I did. Thank God I overcame that terrible fear, that fear that I lived with all of my life. That fear of everything, fear of life, fear of people, fear, but most of all, fear of what you were going to think of me. So desperately needing approval, so fearful that you weren't going to like my dress, my hat, my shoes my voice, what I said, my looks, my nose, my elbows. I mean, I don't know. I just knew that nobody was going to like me. And that fear, that fear that was with me all the time. I thought, I cannot go down to AA alone. I cannot go into a room full of people alone. I can't do it. I'm too afraid. And of course, uh, that fear, I found out about it when I worked on the fourth step. It was terrible. That fear, that fear relating to me, that terrible self. Relieve me of the bondage of self, everything related to self. I always loved it, uh, what Harry Emerson Fosdick, that wonderful old minister in New York, said. Books were like people who lived in a, in a room totally uh, surrounded with mirrors, that everything reflected back on themselves. And that getting sober in AA was like moving the mirrors out and having windows, and you could look out and reach out and touch the rest of the world. And that's really what it's all about, isn't it? We get out of that horrible shell 
I was so tied up in a shell of a, a terrific wall around me. I was so afraid to, to communicate with anybody or say anything, and I was always sure it would be stupid and dumb. And, and oh, I'm, I don't have to go oh, on. I'm sure you're all familiar with those feelings. I think a few of you may have had them. And uh, <clears throat> so I finally got down. Uh, I called AA in October 1944 and uh, went down to the old 24th Street Clubhouse. That was the only place that was AA in New York. In New York City, there was one place where there was a meeting. Isn't that extraordinary? You're talking about how many groups there are here in the Orlando area now. It's the same way everywhere. I mean, there must be thousands of groups in New York City today. And there was one group. Isn't it wonderful how this thing has grown? Isn't it wonderful that we're a part of this terrific thing? Oh, God. Oh. can never stop being grateful that I was given the grace to walk into this fellowship. So I went into the old 24th Street Clubhouse and talked to a lovely guy, and, and he was dear, and he told me his story, and I told him mine, and, and he finally said, you'll do, and I felt pretty good about it. There were some other people there, but he was so kind. I thought to myself, well, I've got to be honest with this man. I must come clean. So I finally turned back to him, and I said, Dan, there's something else I've got to tell you. I think he must have thought I had murdered somebody because I was in such desperate straits. Well, he said, honey, what is it? I said, I have an inferiority complex. <laughs> he did just what you did. He laughed. And, of course, you know what happened. He laughed, and I froze. Son of a bitch, I'll get the hell out of here. <laughs> And he yelled out to the group at the next table, and he said, this gal says she's got an inferiority complex, and they laughed. <laughs> and thank God I recognized that they were laughing with love. And that made all the difference. And then I started to walk this walk, take this journey, this journey of self more than anything else, perhaps, this journey of self-knowledge, self-awareness, self-love, self-forgiveness, not selfishly, not selfishly, but in order to try and become the best person that I can be. Looking back, I always wanted to be, quote, somebody, but I always wanted to be a person of integrity. I always wanted to be a person of honor. I always wanted to be somebody who was loving. And I couldn't be any of those things as long as alcohol was my master because I, I, I didn't know who I was. And so I began to walk the walk, and I began to try and understand what AA was trying to teach me. And I was so damn, I, I was so locked up, I couldn't receive what you were trying to give me. I was terribly slow. I was terribly slow. I can remember sober a year, sitting in the back row of my group, the old Lennox Hill group in New York. No, it wasn't at that point. It must have been longer sober than that, because Lennox didn't start until after I'd been sober a year or more. But anyway... I can remember sitting in the back seat of some meeting and hearing some drawing little girl get up here and say, I've been sober three months now, yes, and I've got a new job, and I'm going to get married next month, and I just bought a Cadillac, and I sit in the back row and think, why doesn't anything good ever happen to me? Forgetting the fact the most wonderful gift in the world had been given me, I was sober, and I had found a way of living that was going to help me to be happy, joyous and free. I didn't realize all that then. I didn't realize how restricted my life was. I didn't re realize how restricted I was. It took me a lot of work in the AA program to begin to understand all that and to finally understand that bondage of self and to get rid of the sick, sick ego. Because that's what it is, I think. It's a sickness of the ego. And we have to find that gold coin of true self. If we don't have healthy egos, we're going to die. It's the sick ego that's killing us. And so we have to find that true gold nugget that's there that's in the core of us. There's a divinity within that shapes our ends, as Shakespeare said. And we have to find that and begin to know that we're God's perfect children. If we just try and thank God the book says spiritual progress, not perfection. Wouldn't we be boring if we were perfect? Oh, God. It would be terrible. This is more fun. This is more exciting. And it also, it, it also means that it's a challenge. It also means that it's a challenge because there's always something we can work for, always something we can work toward to become the kind of person we've always wanted to be, the best that we can of us. None of us are perfect, but we can keep trying. 
to improve and to try through the steps to get an awareness and a knowledge of self as well as that awareness and knowledge of that power. I had a terrible time with the power. You see, I didn't, they say, made a decision. I didn't make the decision. I couldn't decide what God was, and I didn't think I could make a decision until I found out what my power was. And so <clears throat> I, I had that terrible sickness, that ego sickness of, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of God's love. And I kept talking about how I couldn't get the spiritual angle. That was the expression back in then, those days. I slipped around during December, and it wasn't until January 5th, 1945, that I put down the drink, and I finally got sober and began to really try and work AA. But I was a long time doing it. I couldn't talk. I was, I was so tied up with myself, I couldn't speak at meetings. I was so afraid I wouldn't be best. You know, got to be the best. I'm not going to let you listen to me fool around with it, you know. Terrible ego. Very sick. Very sick. I've still got a lot to learn. But anyway, I began to grow, hopefully to grow a little bit and to change. And Roger didn't want any part of it. He didn't want any part of it at all. And eventually, after I'd been sober six years, he and I came to the parting of the ways. My little girls were being hurt. He was drunk every night. And uh, they were upset. He'd take them out in public places and embarrass them. You know how kids are. And it, it seemed the better thing to do. And um, there was no Al-Anon then. It was 1950. There was no Al-Anon at that time. I don't know whether it would have made any difference or not, but I, 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 I love Al-Anon. It's a wonderful program. So there wasn't that. And I began to, <clears throat> to try and take care of my little family by myself. The good thing about it was that at that point, I was able to include AA in my home. Up until then, Roger had said, you can't bring any drunks in here. And I guess he just meant himself. But anyway... <laughs> And the result was that I never had the opportunity in my early days in AA of saying, come on by the house for a cup of coffee. That wonderful camaraderie. And I'd see other people saying, why don't you come on over to my house and we'll have some cake and coffee. And I couldn't do that. But after Roger and I broke up, I could do that. And so the girls, my girls, began to grow up in a house full of AA. And that made a great deal of difference in their lives, I can tell you that. Uh, my older girl came home one day and said, Mommy, I know what I want to be when I grow up. And I said, What do you want to be, honey? And she said, I want to be a ballet dancer and a member of AA. <laughs> well, I knew what she wanted. She wanted the love and the fellowship and that wonderful sense of spirit that you find in AA members. She didn't want the degradation and the despair, but she got the whole package. But she's got 13 years now of AA sobriety. But it wasn't easy. Uh, believe me, it wasn't easy. I say the girls were grow grew up with AA and knew where to turn. I can remember during the, some of the final stages of Ruthie's drinking, I can, one day she said to me after she'd been sober about a year, she said, honey, mother, why didn't you try and tell, 12 step me? I said, now wait a minute. And I, and I relayed this little story to her and she couldn't believe it. But one night she was in the house and she had been fighting with me, of course, and she was drunk as a skunk. And she got out to get in her car. This is down in Florida. Get in her car and down in Florida. I'm in Florida. I was in New York. <laughs> she went out to get in her car and, and drive home, and I'm trying to dissuade her from getting into her car and driving. And I'll never forget, she looked at me and said, For God's sake, if you don't think I've been brought up on that goddamn fellowship, if you don't think I don't know enough about AA, then when I need it, I'll know where to go. <laughs> but she finally gave up. And so she's fine. She's fine. And my other daughter, I sometimes think she was really born to be an Al-Anon. Uh, I can remember... <laughs> I can remember uh, when she was quite little and I was getting ready to go off on a conference. It was one of, one of my first trips, one of my first trips uh, out of the general service office. And uh, I was very nervous about doing it right and so forth. And so I'm <clears throat> sitting at my dressing table, and I, she's leaning over, watching me. And uh, I said, I can't decide whether I should take this big hat. I used to love those cartwheels, you know. It looked marvelous on me. <laughs> I said, I can't decide whether I take the big hat, because it's just so becoming, or whether I should take the little hat, because it tacks more easily. 
And I reiterated this a couple of times, and she finally put her hands on her skinny little hips and said, Mommy, I thought the important thing was what you said, not what you wore. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> but it's wonderful she has Al-Anon. It is wonderful she has Al-Anon. She got into Al-Anon because of her sister. And that was one of the saddest parts of my life. That the two people I loved most in the whole world, my two girls, hated each other. They fought all the time. Christmas used to be a horror, hoping to get through the day without an explosion. And then Ruthie got sober. Liz went to Al-Anon. And about five years ago, the most beautiful healing took place. Oh, maybe it's more than that now. Time goes by so fast. But they love each other. They talk on the phone practically every day. And not only that, but they're friends. And Al-Anon and AA together did that. I love Al-Anon. It's wonderful. And every now and then when I'm a little distraught because my son, who didn't have the opportunity to grow up in the AA family because he'd gone off to college by the time we were uh, having AA in the home, as it were, so he never really and truly got the full gist of it, and he's the one I hurt the most. He's the one that had the full brunt of my alcoholism because he was older. He was 14 when I got sober. And it was very hard for him. But every now and then, because I'm disappointed that our relationship isn't what I wish it were, I've tried to make amends. You know, and I'm a little hurt, perhaps, of something he's done or something he's forgotten to do, whatever it may be. And my al daughter will look at me and say, Mother, just remember, he doesn't have a program. And that's true. How fortunate we are that we have a program to live by, that we have answers, that we have answers to every question. And sometimes just the overwhelming sense of gratitude for being sober, for being happy, joyous, and free sober is enough to, 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 to give you that wonderful feeling, that sense of oneness. And it's that sense of oneness that's so important, that oneness was our source. I, I really think that's why I felt so separated and apart from all during those growing up years. It was that separation from my source. And that's what we find in AA. We find that divinity within that shapes our ends. And I think it's in Matthew that it says, The Father within, he doeth the work. And Bill writes in the big book, The Great Inner Reality. And we come to accept that and to, to know that we are at one with our Creator. And it's that sense of oneness that makes us have that feeling that everything's going to be all right. I guess that's what they mean when they said, turn it over. I couldn't understand what they were talking about when they used to say to me, get yourself out of your own way. Well, what the hell are they talking about? What does that mean? I didn't tie it in with, relieve me from the bondage of self. That's what that is. And that's all that it is. Emerson put it better. He said, get yourself out of the way of the divine circus. Because, of course, when our will is in there, we're cutting it off. We're shutting it off. And so AA became such a part of my life. And I've been so fortunate to have so many wonderful things happen to me in the AA fellowship. I wouldn't be alive today. I wouldn't be 82 years old, you're damn right, if I didn't have AA. Be sure of that. But so many wonderful things have happened. I, I think the, the key has been for me the wonderful sense of love. We get that. When we're here, we get it in meetings, we get it everywhere. And it's in our daily lives. I've, uh, five years ago, I had cancer. And uh, after the radiation, I was pretty ill. And I couldn't take care of myself. And uh, I needn't have worried. There were many people willing to take care of me. But my daughters, those, those children, those girls that I had hurt, you know, it was like the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace. On Saturday, Liz would leave and Ruth would arrive. And the following Saturday, Ruth would leave and Liz would arrive. And it was wonderful. And they took care of me for about four weeks that way <clears throat> before I was able to take care of myself. And after they'd gone and I was alone, I suddenly found these great fool's cap, these legal pads, legal pads, sheets, filled with writing. 
And they were making notes to each other. I've done the laundry. She isn't eating very well. I tried a little pasta. She seems to be able to swallow that. The doctor says she can go into the swimming pool. Don't hover over her. Let her go. That must have been my Al-Anon daughter wrote that. <laughs> So much love. So much love. And in June, I was rushed to the hospital this summer, bleeding internally and had major surgery. And when I came home, the same thing happened. Liz came from Arkansas, stayed two weeks. Ruthie came from Jupiter, stayed two weeks. And they did it without resentment. And it was Ruthie's vacation. And she needed that vacation very badly. But her priorities were such that she knew she'd be less unhappy if she came. I'm putting it that way because that's the truth. She'd be less unhappy if she came to take care of me than if she went on her vacation and felt guilty. I, she loves me. I don't misunderstand. But sometimes we have to make choices based on the less pain rather than what's going to make us happy. And so AA has been wonderful for me. I <clears throat> worked at the intergroup office in New York. From there I went to general service, as you probably know. I spent 17 fascinating, wonderful years there as a heartbeat of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had the opportunity to see Bill, work with Bill, know Bill. I feel very grateful for that. And some wonderful things have happened to me as a result of working there. I've been around the world, I don't know how many times, visited AA in so many faraway places. Learned so many things about AA because I've visited in faraway places. But you know something? I want to tell you something. As far as I'm concerned, people are getting sober today on exactly the same principles, ideas, and steps that I got sober on 45 years ago. There is no need to change. It's all here. And I, I cherish some of the ideas and some of the little slogans and some of the things that were a part of AA then, I hope we don't lose them. Every now and then we see little changes take place. Silly little thing like in the, uh, <clears throat> the little preamble that was read before most meetings where it says, share our experience, strength, and hope. I hear somebody get up and say, share our experiences, strength, and hope. They don't mean the same thing. To say you're going to share your experiences invites a drunkalog. If you say sharing our experience, <laughs> it means how we live. And so I've had the most wonderful life in AA. I'm so grateful for it. And of course, the absolute pinnacle was to be in Seattle in July and to be one of the speakers in the kingdom. I never thought such a wonderful, joyous thing would happen to me. But it was terrific. I wasn't very strong. I was only four weeks out of surgery. But I said to the doctors, I'll do everything you tell me to do except one thing. I'm going to Seattle. <laughs> And so that was a celebration. This is a celebration. Every day is a celebration. Celebration of spirit, of life, of love. God is love. We have love right here. And I love you. And I know you love me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.